There you go. Oh, up. Up. Splendid. Okay, so we're going to take you back. We're going to take you back to August 5th. understand why when mission control got word of the successful landing, they, in scientific terms, lost their You know, the summer before the elections and everyone was getting ready for the, uh, the national conventions, uh, all, you know, everyone's attention was elsewhere. And, uh, you know, you guys might say, oh, something landing on Mars. Of course everyone's going to know about that. But, you know, do you guys all remember the 2008 Mars landing? Do you all remember the 2004 Mars landing? <laughs> Two of them. Okay, so it, to, to us, you know, it seems like, well, everyone heard about the Mars landing because it's a Mars landing. No, everyone heard about the Mars landing because we were able to do so much in social media, live streaming, everything involved everybody uh, in what was going on. So um, stand by here, and I'm going to get this. Oops. We yes, got it. Indeed. I didn't want everyone to see everything else that was on my desktop because I usually have about 20 things open. <laughs> ah, and see, and even that one's not even working right. I hit play on it. Uh, let's see here. There we go. There we go. Okay. Um, that is a selfie. That's a self-portrait taken by Curiosity <laughs> <laughs> on Mars. Um, that and, and if you've seen, there's a wide shot self-portrait of Curiosity, and um, that's just one frame. It was really made up of hundreds of individual images with the arm taking every single angle and, and the entire body. Um, so again, I'm Veronica McGregor. I manage the uh, news and social media office at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. When I started there, uh, well, prior to 10 years ago, I worked for CNN as a producer. And I used to cover JPL and NASA missions. And I loved it so much that I went and joined 
the JPL team, and back then all we did were media relations. All we did were put out press releases and video um, uh, uh, news releases as well. That's totally changed. Everything in our world has changed as it has for other public affairs types um, uh, uh, everywhere. Um, and then Stephanie L. Smith, who uh, works in our office as one of our social media specialists. Thank goodness um, you all know how time-consuming social media can be. It was more than one person could handle. Um, I'm going to give you a quick history here uh, because a lot of people don't understand what JPL is. Um, you hear Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We really don't do jets. We don't even really do propulsion much anymore unless it's ion propulsion. Um, but we predate NASA by decades, and we actually started out in the 30s. Um, this is known as the Suicide Squad, a, a group of students from Caltech who started building rockets on campus and were, after a few minor explosions, were asked to please stop doing it on campus and go up to this dry creek bed up in the San Gabriel Mountains. And they did, and eventually, by the 40s, um, JPL was building uh, uh, rockets that were launching that were setting altitude records at the time. And um, at that time, of course, NASA didn't exist, so we were working for the Army. And I'll let you guess which one's the JPL employee in that picture. <laughs> uh, it, it is part of our culture that we are a little bit different from other, uh, from, the, from, you know, government institutions, I will say. Because of our uh, beginnings with Caltech, we are still part of Caltech. We're the only NASA center. There are 10 of them around the country. We're the only one that is actually managed by a university. And Stephanie and I are actually Caltech employees. But 100% of the work we do is funded by NASA, and we do it for NASA. So we've always, um, we, we always look at ourselves as being a little bit different, a little bit outside the mold, um, which is a lot of fun, actually. Um, and I wanted to say it wasn't all men back in those days, and no, those are not secretaries. They are computers. This is what, the, they were the computers at JPL computing trajectories for spacecraft before they had computers. Um, if you know your space history very well, you know that Sputnik launched, and a few months later the United States followed uh, with their own satellite called Explorer 1. Explorer 1 was actually built at JPL. Um, the the uh, second stage of the rocket was uh, from JPL, the first stage from the Redstone Arsenal. And uh, the, the, uh, the lore is that actually we had all that built and ready to go. We could have done it first, but um, we were told not to and to put sandbags in the top of our rockets just to make sure they didn't accidentally go into orbit. So when you hear the story about how the U.S. was able to build it and launch it in three months, well, um, it was pretty much there and ready to go. Um, Today we're 177 acres, still by the dry creek bed, and uh, we're about 10 minutes away from the rest of the Caltech campus. Uh, coincidentally, we're the size of the original Disneyland, plus or minus one acre, I believe, and we do call ourselves Disneyland for nerds. It's like Tomorrowland, but real. Exactly. <laughs> and uh, this is our universe, just at JPL. You know, NASA has, I believe, something like 60 missions. Uh, that are ongoing, you know, there's the human space program, and then there's, of course, all of these um, satellites and, and uh, uh, spacecraft that we have out across the solar system, and actually, um, these are only the JPL missions. When you hear that a couple of people work on the uh, Curiosity Twitter account, we don't want you thinking that there's actually two people employed solely to do the Curiosity Twitter account. We're doing uh, all of these missions and more all of the historical missions, all of the future missions. So we have a pretty big um, array of things that we do, and uh, NASA JPL is our um, uh, flagship account for our center. And then, of course, at NASA, there are about, across the agency, about 500 different social media accounts at this point. Uh, first one started in 2008, and many more quickly followed, and there's a full list of all of those at nasa.gov slash connect. Um, we're going to, since we're from JPL, we're going to concentrate on what we do from JPL. So this is uh, a partial list. These are the, uh, the, the accounts that um, I opened, and um, there are many, many other accounts now, um, not many more, maybe about twice the length of this list, being operated out of JPL by a couple other teams. Uh, but we're operating these, except for Cassini Saturn, which I did turn over to the uh, Cassini team for them to go ahead and handle. Um, Curiosity is our biggest account right now, Asteroid Watch, close behind. They're asterisked because um, both of them made it onto the Time Magazine Best 140 Twitter Feeds lists, uh, Asteroid Watch last year and Curiosity this year. 
But I'm going to tell you, tell you how this all started with NASA and social media. And uh, it all goes back to 2008 when we had this mission landing on Mars um, known as the Phoenix Lander. It was going to land on a Sunday afternoon over Memorial Day weekend. And it occurred to me that, you know, there's not a lot of people sitting watching the news on a Sunday afternoon over Memorial Day weekend. People are going to be traveling. They're going to be at the beach. They're going to be at parks. How are we going to get news to these people? And of course, in my mind, though, I'm thinking the hardcore space fans. How am I going to let them know that we've landed and whether we've landed safely? And around that time, Twitter was, uh, you know, kicking off. It had been announced, I think, the year before at South by Southwest. And uh, I went ahead and opened a Twitter account for Phoenix because it was the easiest way for me to get news of the mission to a mobile device. It was free. It had no advertising. It was a dream come true. And uh, I set up this uh, profile for Phoenix. And in some crazy uh, uh, last minute thought, I, I decided to do it in the first person. And this was after I looked at Twitter, looked at a lot of the corporations that had accounts on Twitter at that time. They were all, they all read like press release headlines, very impersonal. Most of them cut off because they were automated feeds. And there was just nothing engaging about them. And then I saw some, some people who were on Twitter using it really effectively. And it was because it, it was inviting. It, you know, just in the first person, it, it invites you to ask a question or, or send a comment back. And with the very first tweet that I did with Phoenix, which was to announce that I was three weeks away from landing on Mars and the distance at that time, immediately I got replies from people. They were either cheering the robot on or uh, they were asking a question. What are you going to do on Mars? Well, I'm going to be looking for ice. I'm going to be looking for water ice under the surface on Mars. And it kicked off this conversation, which was so unique because we had never had this open door where the public could just send us a question and we could reply so quickly. Now, I know today, you know, we all take this for granted. It's so easy. You can do this, <laughs> whether it's customer service with a business or if it's a government agency. Most some of them, a lot of them are here. Um, but in 2008, this was just, we were all just blown away by what was happening. Um, that's Phoenix on the surface of Mars. That's its version of its selfie. <laughs> and um, the mission did actually dig down discovered water ice under the surface of Mars. And, um, and I tweeted that. Uh, that tweet alone changed the way a lot of journalists do their job because uh, some journalists will tell you we broke the news on Twitter. We did not. We followed all the rules. We had, uh, it was all posted to the NASA website first. And the way that would normally work is you post it to the NASA website, you send out the email to the media, and you wait for those stories to, to appear online on their websites or in the papers. And that was really the extent of the involvement we would have in the story, unless they called and asked some questions. But here, as soon as the story was posted, I hit the button, this tweet went out, and word got out first on Twitter. And for a lot of the space and science journalists, they said that changed everything for them. And then they realized, now they all follow our accounts. And now, you know, actually, I think we get better coverage today for our space missions than we ever had back in the day of press releases. Um, some of the comments that we had back um, from Phoenix that showed us that what we were doing was successful. And it was within weeks of that account opening and taking off that uh, many other NASA accounts followed. This account actually was the fifth most followed account on Twitter during the summer of 2008. Was anyone on Twitter back then? Yay. Okay, good, a few people in this room. Um, back in the summer of 2008, you only needed about 40,000 followers to be the fifth most followed account on Twitter. <laughs> uh, the number one account at that time was uh, Barack Obama, and he had 60,000. I love that you said only 40,000. <laughs> <laughs> like most people, 40,000, oh. <laughs> they even know that. <laughs> That's true. Well, you know, yeah, and it was just amazing that this took off as quickly and as well as it did, and a lot of blogs were writing about it. Wired wrote about it. New York Times was writing about it. Um, uh, and again, it was, it was the fact, I think, you know, it, the story evolved from they're on Twitter to, oh my God, they're answering questions. And that is where people picked up and started um, following the account and asking us things. We, with all of our missions today, we really take pride in that more than 50% of our posts are going to be responses to questions. There was a question there? Uh, I tried it out, and I kind of thought it was too hokey, but 
I looked at it two ways. One, again, I had seen other posts. Uh, you know, I didn't want it to sound like a headline service. I wanted it to sound more inviting than that. And two, saying I am landing in three weeks is easier than saying, or takes up less space than the spacecraft is landing in three weeks, Phoenix is landing in three weeks. I was just looking at saving character space. But you know, I tested it out. So I did a couple in first person, and then I did a few that were not, you know, not first person, traveling at, you know, 38,000 miles per hour, two weeks to landing. You know, you didn't get the response from people. When I said, I'm traveling at this speed, I'm doing a course correction tonight, I'm targeting Mars, I found my landing spot, I see it in my sights. Um, it changed everything and it, and it really encouraged people that we were inviting them to have a conversation. And Phoenix was a rather short-lived mission um, <laughs> because it was near the North Pole of Mars. We knew it was going to freeze to death. The solar panels uh, had to stop operating. That was my final tweet. Um, which I did in binary code because I figured once the spacecraft had stopped uh, being able to communicate with Earth, I really couldn't like <laughs> go out of character and say, um, you know, hey, I'm still here and, you know, goodbye everybody. So I, I came up with this idea of doing it as sort of like the last gasp that could make it to people's um, computers. And uh, interestingly, you know, during that summer of 2008, uh, the game Portal was still extremely popular <laughs> and there were a ton of people who were, um, gamers that played Portal that were following this account. In fact, it was all people really into technology that were on there in 2008. Um, those folks were uh, some of our, our biggest fans, biggest followers, and also most helpful to me as a person who was learning Twitter that summer. And so that uh, I, I posted that final tweet and I waited to see how quickly they would figure out what that was. And it was the word triumph, which was really sort of a nod back to uh, the folks. Uh <laughs> No, it wasn't. I had seen others do it. I had seen others do it. But, um, but yeah, if, you know, if you're familiar with the Portal uh, credit song, it's, uh, well, here, actually, someone wrote it back. And I, I would get these. This was a triumph. I'm making a note here. Huge success. It's hard to overstate my satisfaction. Those were actually the words from the Portal credit song. And all summer long, people had been tweeting this back to me. Um, and so, in a little way, I, I wanted to make a nod to them. Now, the account closed. And like I said, you know, I felt... It could, I could not, in my heart, break the character I had created and then come back on the account and say, and now I'm back and I'm really NASA JPL and you can follow us here and there. And you know, it just it wouldn't have been authentic and people would have not been happy about that. They, they, they really bought into this character. So before Phoenix stopped communicating, I did have Phoenix try to encourage people to follow other mission accounts. But even so, there was this huge gap and Phoenix was gone and I thought, I'm a crazy person to walk away from 40,000 people who are following this account. I posted a few later tweets in brackets saying from mission control so they would understand you know, it was a different voice. But for the most part, I let that just stay. And what we did next was um, I had seen some tweet ups happening around the country. And they were mostly just based on geographic location. You know, Do you live in LA? Are you on Twitter? Come meet us. Are you in Minneapolis? Are you on Twitter? Come, let's get together. And I went to one in LA, and it was nice, but there was no common thread. There was, you know, there wasn't a shared hobby or theme or anything. And I thought, okay, wouldn't this be great to do something like this? But do it at JPL. Invite our followers from this account, and let them meet the scientists and the engineers who had really been doing all this amazing work all summer, and let them talk to them directly. And we do tours at JPL. You can come in. We have amazing tour guides, and they'll bring you around. But this time, we were having the scientists and the engineers do it all. And they loved the idea. So we posted an invitation to people. And it was first come, first serve registration. We had 120 people signed up. My concern being, um, that's our first tweet up at JPL. My concern was uh, people driving across town in Los Angeles at 5 in the evening. The vote was people preferred evening time so they could come after work. Um, and, and whether people would want to make that drive. Instead, we had people register from around the United States and a few from uh, abroad. We had people fly in from Washington, D.C. We had people fly in from Washington State, uh, a couple other states in between, and it was all to come and spend three hours at JPL to meet scientists and engineers. And it was another one of those uh, serendipitous aha moments. Oh my gosh, I had no idea that people would want to do this. Um, 
so we did, uh, uh, you can see this is um, the guy who wrote all the software for Phoenix. Um, because I knew we had so many people who were in the technology industry. He, he loved talking to people about how Phoenix worked, the amount of code, what it was written in, and everything else. And uh, we brought in about 15, 20 speakers to talk a little bit about uh, not only Phoenix, but several of our other missions. Um, it went really well, and NASA also picked up on the tweet-up idea, and eventually uh, several tweet-ups were held to bring the public into uh, the, the last shuttle mission launches and also a lot of launches of other spacecraft that have happened since th 2009. And uh, it's usually for about 150 people and these events went from being a three-hour evening event to a two-day event at the Kennedy Space Center and that's a, um, a look at, we all, you know, traditionally now we always do a group shot when we do these and uh, the circle in the middle, that's uh, the administrator of NASA, Charles Bolden. Uh, up to the administrator of NASA, they believe um, so strongly in these events and what's become of them that even the administrator uh, shows up, talks, takes questions, takes a picture with everybody. And the key thing here, again, not only did people want to come from around the country, around the world, was when they came in and we first thought and they first thought, it was all to meet us and to, to talk to scientists and engineers, but they met each other. and. As one later posted, um, I came for the robots, but I stayed for the people. And he means they stayed in that. He is still talking today, uh, four years later, with those same people. He's in groups with those people. He goes to additional events with those people. He advocates for NASA and our programs with those same people. And now that number has grown to about 4,000 people around the country. So now we're going to shift into Curiosity. I just want to give you uh, that background there. So Curiosity, as you know, landed in August, and here's two of the three. Um, Courtney O'Connor is the third of our current uh, team, and um, we're doing all of the tweets for all of those missions that I showed you earlier, and, and Curiosity is the one, of course, that's taking up a lot of our time. Um, happily so. So uh, we, we were thinking, was there a question? No? Okay. After we had done, uh, you know, we knew Twitter was a success. We knew that uh, tweet ups, in person events were a success. The, the next thought was okay, so what can we do now moving forward again with curiosity to bring people in? We want them to take ownership of this lander. This is your lander. You know, you all paid for this lander. We want you to adopt it, we want you to love it. Um, now, one of the things we have at JPL is this is an overview of our clean room. That is part of the rover spacecraft being built down below. And if you come for a tour of JPL uh, or you bring your kids to JPL, you can stand in this gallery and take your picture and you can look down and go, wow, they're putting together something that is going to land on Mars. Well, not many, you know, we do get th uh, in the tens of thousands of people coming each year, but I wanted more people to have this experience. So the idea was that we would put in a webcam, that's simple enough in the gallery so that more people could view what was going on with uh, building the rover. And this was something that took many, many months to get approved. Um, we eventually did get it in. People were curious as to how we were going to do this. They thought it would be boring. But what we wanted to do that was different was not just the webcam, but we were using Ustream and making great use of the um, chat box. It wasn't just so people dropped by individually, look at a picture, and leave. It was all to create a conversation and get those people talking to each other. And so when we got this going, what we did was uh, we were live 24-7, two hours every single day. We'd open up the chat box. People knew what time we were going live or what time the chat box was opening. And every day we would have repeat customers come in and watch, and we'd have a lot of new people come in and watch. And in the beginning, we were answering every single question, but uh, people got so good, the people who were dropping by almost every day, a lot of students, um, people would ask a question and they'd answer it for us. It was really kind of great. So then, you know, we started, this, they, they all started talking to each other. Um, I'll tell you, one of the biggest problems we had uh, getting this camera going, I mean, there were a lot of people who were a little concerned about us putting a camera in for, for certain reasons. There's actually um, government regulations uh, about uh, protecting um, uh, information on how spacecraft is built, it's called ITAR. So, you know, we had to... Uh, be concerned about that and showing too much of what was going on. Um, we also had concerns from the mission team themselves, the folks in the bunny suits there, saying, wait a minute, I'm going to be on camera all day long. I mean, admittedly, you know, none of us would want to be on camera all day long at work, right? I mean, it would be kind of creepy. Um, so we did work out, you know, things for them. We, we explained, one, no one knows who you are. We can't see your face. Um, 
we also made sure that we were focused on just one very small part of the clean room. That clean room was massive, and we showed them a picture of where we are so they could just walk out of the frame if they needed to. A lot of them actually take their breaks inside the clean room because it's not enough time to get go through that whole dressing procedure again. Um, and slowly, you know, they started to like this. And then they started telling us that their families were watching, their kids were watching, um, their parents on the other side of the country were watching. They couldn't come to JPL. And then one of the questions we frequently got, <laughs> and I'm handing it to you right after this one, <laughs> um, was people saying, can you get the guys in the clean room? Can they wave to the camera? We'd get this every day, multiple times. And we'd have to say, no, sorry. They're building a robot. They're building <laughs> a <laughs> robot. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and we're in the chat, you know, actually in a completely different building than the room that, that the building that houses this clean room. Um, but we did start to notice people, uh, those guys, you know, walking out in the middle of the floor with the phone standing there for a really long time, and then going. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, that was waving to their kid. Um, but eventually, <laughs> we saw somebody ask one day if they can all wave. <laughs> and it turned out this was when we knew they were monitoring the feed inside the clean room, that they had adopted this so much, that they loved it so much, that they appreciated that people could see what they were doing. They were appreciating that people were interested, asking questions. Uh, they started jumping in and answering questions. <laughs> we could, but you know that you know that would just be for those viewers at that one single time. And you yeah, you could, you could. <laughs> what we did do is we brought in members of this team to do the live chat with us, and so we would promote that that the uh, the, the the people responsible for building the wheels and the and the. Um, the rocker bogey system that it's known as, the wheels on the side of the rover, would come in and talk about those. That, um, uh, uh, who else did we have? We had a lot of different people in here. Oh, oh, oh yeah. let's take Okay, uh, so yes, these experts that we had in the chat turned out to be one of the most um, crucial things for us internally, was building these communications channels with the engineers and with the scientists. So we, yeah, we had a mobility expert, we had the chief engineer, um, oh gosh, we had some scientists come in and we would advertise uh, these special chats both in preceding chat windows, but also on Facebook and Twitter. So we're, we're building an audience online and we're building internal communications channels. We're learning the mission. Well, Veronica said that we've got you know, 20 plus flying missions and another 10 instruments at JPL and all the historical missions. So all that news is coming out of our office and we're tweeting about all of that, and we really do have to be generalists. We needed to be specialists about curiosity. This is a flagship mission for us, for the agency. It was really important that the three of us understood it inside and out. We couldn't wait until two days before landing to read the press kit and say, okay, I know everything that I need to know. So in communicating with these uh, engineers and scientists, we learned the mission, we also were able to migrate the community that came to watch every day here to Facebook and Twitter. So we'd close every chat window with those account handles, which turned out to be really useful because nobody knew about them. We introduced people who were already fans and were able to take that audience with us. We didn't lose them when this rover stopped being built. So another place that we took them was to YouTube. And this moment, this video, uh, Quick poll in the room, seven minutes of terror, ring any bells with anybody? All right, yeah, yeah, I got some <laughs> fist pumps in the back of the room, I love it. Um, this was like our teaser trailer for landing. And this was our first viral video, real, I think. It, it was, yeah, it was, but uh, interestingly enough, we had done a similar video for the 2004 rover landings, a similar video for the 2008 landings. Now, 2004, YouTube didn't exist. Uh, so it was only on our website. 2008, YouTube existed. We put it on YouTube. But, you know, the share buttons really weren't there yet until maybe late 2008. So it missed that wave. And then you have a year where you've got share buttons and um, YouTube, and you just see an incredible difference because all three videos were very well done. Oh, yeah, all of that. Oh yeah, the absolutely. ability to take it with you, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. It it all 
came together in the uh, perfect storm is not the right word because it's so negative, but in a really good way for us um, this summer. Yeah, and, and we do everything geared towards mobile. I mean, we post these webs uh, videos to the NASA and the JPL website, but we wouldn't put that out in our, in our tweet, really. We'll send them to YouTube because we know it's going to be much easier for them to view it. And we do look at how many are coming in through mobile devices, and of course, and it's been... Oh yeah, yeah. It you know, I, I believe it's about 30% uh, coming in and clicking on some of the things that we're putting out on Twitter or coming through mobile, if not more. Um, so I don't know how much that, you know, relates to everything else. Um, I had another thought, but go ahead. Yeah, I just want to take us really quickly through the rest of, of Curiosity's social presence here. Rover's on Facebook. Um, more than half a million people like this rover there. So if you want to join them, uh, facebook.com slash Mars Curiosity. Um, see how that stacks up against JPL. Our center count uh, is, has been eclipsed everywhere by the popularity of this rover. So now the rover can help introduce everybody to the JPL accounts. Um, let's see, tweet ups we've already talked about, but uh, this is a, a view inside the tent, literally, uh, of the event that we had at Kennedy Space Center back in November of 2011 for launch. There's our group. There is Curiosity on the launch pad. So, you know, we give behind the scenes access, like the, the VIP level access. This is how much we love our social media followers. Um, and then by giving them that access and giving them the ability to take pictures and share it with their followers, they become ambassadors for the mission, for JPL, for NASA. And um, they are some of our strongest advocates. We had an event uh, at landing. There's our science panel. These are many of the people in the Seven Minutes of Terror video. So if you go back and you watch that, oh, I guess these are the engineers. Yeah. All right. Um, we've got hands-on demos. We put the social back in social media. And this one-day event, we actually coordinated between seven different NASA centers. We used uh, a feed on our Ustream and also via NASA television. But then we had an audio bridge. We took uh, advantage of the communications channels that we had for traditional media, and we used them to connect the centers and allow social media participants at these other NASA centers to ask questions of the experts that we had at JPL. Because it's a huge mission. There are thousands of people working on it. All of them were at JPL, and we're like, oh man, how are we gonna make them accessible to people at Goddard in Virginia or people at Glenn in Ohio? This is how we did it. Um, 58 million potential Twitter impressions from that one day and one event. Uh, we Ustreamed it, yes, and we partnered with Ustream. We make ads and they help put them up and they help us harness their great, huge, come for the puppies, stay for the science <laughs> audience. Right, and the whole point is to put everything, you know, where the people are, not, you know, we, we do also stream everything to the NASA.gov website, but unless you're already a space fan, you're never going to find the page where it is. Um, so it's putting it out there where, you know, Stephanie said, it's people watching puppies and Eagle Cam and things like that, and then they see this thing, you know, NASA, and they'll click on it. And extremely important for us to stream the landing, because look at the time there we were starting to go live. Um, you know, I the actual landing was about an hour after this. It was too late for any, all your local news was off the air. If you were in the central time zone, Mountain Central, Eastern, you, your newscasts were done for the night. You weren't going to be able to watch this live. In the Pacific time zone, you know, you were okay. It was about 10.30 p.m. Um, that we actually landed. And so the goal was to make sure that everybody could watch this landing live wherever they were and watch it in its entirety. Now, if you did watch it on the news, you probably saw 20 seconds of the last, you know, 20 seconds of it landing in the room erupting into cheers. Um, we started streaming some of our mission um, commentaries a couple years ago with some asteroid flybys, and people watched it on Ustream and said, why don't you guys do this all the time? This is amazing. We've never, you know, they had just never seen an entire commentary. We've done it going back decades, but they didn't have access to it. Now they have access. Now they can go through the full two, three hours of the suspense, the challenges, the what can go wrong, uh, 
and, and they enjoyed it. They wanted to be the fly on the wall there. Yes? Can you speak to the social uh, NASA that made it either easy or difficult to sell for the decision makers or hardcore scientists and puppies and puppies? Um, as, as the lead into hard science? I mean, how, how does that dynamic work? Oh, no, it wasn't any problem at all. Those were all on different channels on the Ustream website. And we knew that those, you know, people who like those things are going to Ustream to watch that. They might be going there to watch uh, wrestling. They might have been going there to watch a, a, a rock star who was doing an event that day. But, you know, just like you go to YouTube to look at a video and then you get distracted, mm -hmm. um, you know, Ustream, it was much the same thing. We wanted people who were coming in uh, from every kind of interest to see that we were there too and know that they could watch. And of course, we promoted the landing over um, you know all of our social media accounts with the Twitter, uh, Twitter and Facebook and and everything else. So did you give any caution or hesitation or what? No. Or did you say I'm going to do it that we know how to do it? No. I will say that at JPL we started all of these first. We we kind of do that. Go back to the guy with the no shirt on. You know we kind of like take <laughs> these. We we kind of always feel like we can maybe jump in um, first mm -hmm. and test the waters. And so both with Twitter and um, Ustream, uh, we, we made use of those platforms first. And if it had been a disaster, you know, everyone would have stepped back. But instead, NASA saw that it was working phenomenally well. And now there's a NASA television channel on Ustream. There's several other NASA centers on Ustream. And um, NASA now actually embeds their Ustream feed into their NASA.gov page. Uh, and so, no, nah, you know, it's a matter of testing it. You know, the Phoenix Twitter account, uh, I was waiting for someone to say, stop that. Mm -hmm. um, I never put the NASA logo on that page, just in case somebody was, uh, didn't, didn't like it and thought I was doing anything wrong. Um, luckily, because I am the manager of the news office, I know what all the rules are, and I knew how to follow the rules. If it had been a random, Oh, somebody else, a, a scientist or engineer who didn't know like when the press release was going out and when to put, you know, when it was appropriate to start releasing news to the public once NASA had already announced it. You know, it could have gone the wrong way, and they might have looked at Twitter as being something that was, um, you know, upstaging the agency. But because I was always following the rules, um, not, you know, not not really explaining a lot before I started, but always following the rules, it, it, they loved it and it worked. And there is some very, very elastic language in the NASA charter uh, that says that we are required to share our activities and results, so the missions and the data, with as wide an audience as possible. And it does not specify how to do it. And so it may have used to be traditional media. We haven't abandoned traditional media. But social media is where the people are. So if they're there, if there are millions of people going to watch puffins and puppies and eagles, we're going to put our science there too. You know, I, I think it has helped, but I don't have any hard data on that. And since we're not at NASA headquarters, really, uh, John Yambrek and Jason Townsend would probably be better able to answer those questions. Because we are from a contracted center, we are actually not allowed to lobby for any of our missions or anything. So, um, you know, instead, our goal is just to put the, uh, put the news out there, make sure that people are buying into this mission, are excited about this mission, and participating in the mission. And then we have to just hope that it's having an impact. And we'll talk about impacts, actually. All right. Uh, uh, yeah, we should. On that point, yeah. though, I mean, um, do you guys, how are you ba thinking about balancing uh, being informative versus enabling? It, 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 can, it can never be at the expense of the science. Um, we would use a hook, like um, song lyrics or movie quotes. Uh, but uh, like 140 characters do not um, engagement and understanding make. So we would use a hook, and then there would be a little piece of news, and then there would be some kind of call to action. So the rover wants you to go and watch this video, or look at these pictures, or uh, read this article, download this PDF, and you go to that next step, and that's where the learning happens. And as Stephanie often says, we're just the carnival barkers. We're just, <laughs> <laughs> we're the folks standing outside the tent waving something, you know, really great and saying, but come inside and see the whole show. We want you to see everything about this mission. All right. So quickly here, because I know that we are at time. Uh, yeah. We, are we good? Oh. Okay. Uh, well, yes, here is our hive mind again, Veronica, Courtney, who are both um, 
professionals, and I'm the <laughs> weirdo who sits with them. <laughs> anyway, that's us on landing night wearing our, our fabulous blue shirts. Um, took a lot of heat for those shirts. 3.2 million people watched landing on Ustream, um, plus another 1.2 million on the NASA.gov, uh, NASA television website. And we got a lot of kudos from traditional media for this. Um, the, oh, the one I was looking for here was the, the one from Mashable. Yeah, Mashable, it was in yep. the video that uh, we actually beat cable news. Mm -hmm. um, and that was actually, Ustream put out a press release saying the number of people watching Ustream that night was more than all of the cable news channels combined. So that is, um, I'm sourcing them on that information. Um, but we thought that was great, and, and that again was our goal. We needed to find a way that everyone could watch this no matter where they were. And every time I hear someone say, I watched Landing, especially when I'm on the East Coast, I'm like, great, and where were you watching it? You know, because some people had multiple computers set up. They were watching, uh, we had multiple feeds going out. We had the uh, commentary with the um, video roll-ins and interviews, or if you only wanted to have the fly on the wall camera, just what Mission Control was saying. Raw and uncut. Raw and uncut, you could watch that channel. Um, we had the real-time animation that showed exactly what was going on with the spacecraft on another channel. So there were all these different channels people could watch and people picked their favorite and, and some people used multiple. And um, while all that's going on, we were also live tweeting and this was the tweet heard round the solar system. I'm safely on the surface of Mars, the part that no one ever remembers. Gale <laughs> Crater, I am in you! <laughs> and Will Wheaton was on lab with us that night too. So. We had his blessing. <laughs> 72,000 retweets. So. Which is Bieber level. Yes. <laughs> I think it, it may be our only Bieber level tweet that we've had. Um, you mentioned the tens of thousands. <sighs> not any lower than that. But, but it's, you know. sad, it's sad that that's the comparison. Right. He's got 38 million followers. If you're in the social media world, I don't think that you can ignore that. No, you know, it, it, yeah. it, let's not you know, look at the, the mm, tenor of the content, but uh, <laughs> the size of the audience is key. There's, there's an engagement there, and you know, we, can we can learn from that. Do you know how many um, followers you picked up on the YouTube channel? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I can tell you how many we picked up from that afternoon to the end of that week. So we were at 130,000 followers on App Mars Curiosity the day before. The day before the day before landing. We did a tweet chat between the rover and Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, it took maybe an hour, and we went from 130,000 to 150,000. And we're like, oh, oh, <laughs> maybe this is gonna get big. Um, well, here, I'll just walk you through some of the numbers. Uh, three, almost 375,000 tweets about Curiosity and MSL happened the week around landing, so a little bit before landing throughout for one week, it created 1.2 billion potential Twitter impressions. So this is very careful to say potential impressions. Uh, if the rover has a million followers, tweets once, it's a million impressions. Potential. Potential. Because we all know yeah. that everyone reads their feed, but this is just a number that we can count. You're not counting um, well, you know, these aren't individuals, and so yes, yeah. this could be included in this. Could be, you know, there, there are a certain number of individuals that probably got 20, t 20 different tweets, you know, about right. it. And so, um, but this is uh, uh, using our service kind of blew up um, trying to even count. Uh, yeah, the, some of the queries timed out, so that's why I had to limit it to one week. Uh, about yes. So why? why? Why does NASA and why does NASA JPL do social media? I think it goes back to the charter. It goes back mostly to the NASA charter and making it available, making all of our information. We are a civilian space agency, and it was one of the key parts that Congress put into the NASA charter in 1958. It, it, it's what um, makes our office at JPL a must-do, not a should-do. Um, and, and across NASA, Th this is a requirement. And so that 
is, is uh, one reason. And then the other reason was just that um, we were anxious to take uh, advantage of all of these new things that were coming along since, you know, way earlier in, in the 2000s with um, when iTunes went online. Now, I will say that a lot of people in the JPL newsroom, a lot of us are former journalists who covered the program before we went to go work at JPL. When iTunes started up and podcasting started, my deputy, who is an ABC News radio veteran, was ecstatic. She hadn't done radio in about 10 years, and she jumped on and started podcasting. And she does a great job, phenomenal. Um, I am from CNN, and I love video. When YouTube came along, my whole video team stopped. Well, they still have to do video news releases, but they started doing all these other kinds of videos, fully produced and, you know, the graphics and, and everything else to make things really compelling and educational as well. So I think we kind of ran off into the things that we love to do. Um, but, but behind all of that, we couldn't have done it if it hadn't been for the NASA charter. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you know what I think is so crazy is prior to Twitter, I think, um, we would, you know, have our meetings at work. We'd talk about our educational initiatives, our, our, you know, setting up our exhibits, you know, outside the Smithsonian in Washington. We would talk about how mm -hmm. wonderful it would feel to know that we had encouraged one person to go, you know, to go into engineering, to select this as a career. Yeah, right. W but we were saying one person, you know, I mean, because that's all you might ever hear back. And today I laugh at that because now over Twitter we and, and we use Reddit and everything else, we're getting these messages back all the time now. I've changed my major. I've applied for the astronaut program. Mm -hmm. Because who knew how to apply for the astronaut program before we had Twitter and we could tweet the link to it? Um, over and over again, yeah. right? It, the, there's, there's, there's something about you know not fire and forget. You're not always going to hit the same audience every time you tweet. So right. put it out again. So, you know, it, it is, it was definitely to inspire. I mean, absolutely, uh, to inspire people to get a bigger audience. Yeah. It <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, so back to landing week. Facebook reach 17.4 million. Yay, share button. And I think that, <laughs> that was when we had 30,000 followers, well before. We went from 30,000 followers to well over 500,000 followers today. So, And a lot of this was driven by the pictures. That rover has 17 cameras, and we are very thankful for every single one of them, because uh, you know they get sent back. <laughs> there we go. Um, how are we going to keep it going? Well, we're always looking for the next forum, and um, this was about three weeks after landing. Uh, we got together a group of scientists and engineers from the Mars Science Laboratory mission. We just curiosity. Curiosity is the name of the rover. Mars Science Laboratory, the name of the mission. Um, we stuck them in our conference room. Uh, we hold up for three hours, and we answered hundreds of and questions. We got about eight thousand. It was, <laughs> and it wasn't just um, you know answering those those individuals' questions. The uh, added benefit for us was that there were journalists lurking in the Reddit, and voila, we got coverage that we weren't even expecting from this. So, so many science journalists uh, have been cut. Uh, they've had their budgets cut. People can't travel anymore. They're looking for story leads anywhere they can find them. And so we have a tremendous number of science journalists who follow all of our social media channels, and they're using it to, uh, to come up with ideas for new pieces. Um, it was and is the fifth most now. Fifth most, yeah. Number five on the list of all-time Reddit ill mayors. We, we were in third, but I think then that brought yeah, there's some guy named Obama. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Bill Gates, and Bill Nye. A lot of science and technology up here. Science, technology, and government. Yay! <laughs> yeah. About they are. That's a fabulous place to do things. And we've used not only the AMA. Um, we've used not only the AMA subreddit. We've also used Ask Science if we want to just hit the audience that, you know, really already has an interest in science. And the 2X chromosome, that is a fabulous place. We put our women engineers, scientists there to mentor um, women who are looking for how do they get into careers. Um, you know, what's it like? What's the climate like for a woman in that uh, area? So that this is a really great way to share that information. All right, now I'm going to talk about, you know, if I, uh, uh, four minutes? Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about something else that we do. It's not all Mars Curiosity. We also have this account called Asteroid Watch. Um, 
because JPL leads the Near Earth Object Program Office for NASA, um, there are telescopes around the world. Um, a, a few, that some of them are NASA assets contracted, and some of them are amateurs and and other uh, um, observatories around the world that feed all of their data of recently observed new asteroids goes into a, a one location and it comes to our team and then they calculate where exactly the asteroid will pass Earth, whether it poses a danger to Earth, and usually at any given time um, we have a long list of asteroids that um, on, on the website that are passing the what we call an Earth's neighborhood and that would be something within 40 lunar distances. Um, I think we go out about f uh, 4 million miles, I mean actually it could be even further than that, but on my Twitter account, on the Twitter account for Asteroid Watch, I, I only tweet the ones that are coming maybe within three lunar distances. And a lunar distance is just a nice way for people to visualize exactly how far away that is. I could say, uh, you know, 800,000 miles, but, you know, three lunar distances works a little bit better. It's more like, yeah, it's about 850,000 miles. Um, but what happened was, while I thought it was incredibly cool, um, when these things come close, because all the uh, observatories are going to turn their telescopes on them, they're all they're, our radar is going to turn on them. Um, I we all think this is really fun and neat. And I posted the first time that we had an asteroid passing Earth at about uh, two uh, lunar distances, and panic ensued. <laughs> and then I went, oh, okay. Um, this account went from zero to eight hundred thousand followers like almost overnight. And then I realized. Oh, they're not space fans. <laughs> These are people who are just terrified <laughs> of, of asteroids. And, and so this was another one of those, oh my gosh, moments uh, uh, of, okay, now wh what can we do with this, you know? Know your audience. Know your audience. One, you know, it's a whole different psychology. I am going to tweet things completely different. <laughs> um, the word safe goes into every tweet about an asteroid passing near Earth. Um, and and what's great though is what I'm, the goal here is not only do I tweet about the asteroids and the comets and, and things that are passing close, but also um, you know some other interesting research, um, retrieval, asteroid retrieval. Um, but I'm also promoting our other missions here because I feel like this is this you know audience that really came in with very little knowledge about space. Um, they're not born space fans, and so we're gonna. This is a great way for me to now <laughs> introduce them to the other things we're doing. Um, so uh, you probably, uh, I don't know if you remember, but you know, a couple months ago, um, there was this uh, very large asteroid that was going to pass very close to Earth. Um, only, what was it? Uh, I don't have it off the top February of my head. February 15th. February 15th, we DA 14. Like rendezvous with comets and asteroids around Valentine's Day. Yay, right. love is in the air and also <laughs> flying space rocks. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we set up on Ustream to do a, uh, a live show. It's funny, the asteroid was actually passing on the opposite side of Earth over Asia. There was not a single NASA observatory that could spot this asteroid as it went by, and we wanted to do a live show on Ustream. So we ended up contacting observatories everywhere else around the world that could see it in real time at closest approach. We, went, uh, we found a couple observatories in Australia. So one was an uh, amateur. One was sort of a mom and pop educational observatory for kids in Perth, Australia. Uh, there was an uh, observatory in Israel, and then there was another observatory in Spain that often does um, uh, uh, spots asteroids actually for our near Earth object program. And as the globe turns, you know, different observatories were going to be able to see the asteroid. For us in the United States, it was going to take 12 hours after closest approach for any of the uh, 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 observatories based here to see it. So we went with a lot. We were planning to use all of these other live. Um, Observatories. We taught them all how to use Ustream. We had them plug into Ustream. We captured their Ustream feed. We put it on our Ustream feed. But first, what happened the night before? I'm sitting at my computer at home and I'm answering everyone's questions about DA14. No, it's not going to hit us. No, it's not going to kill us. No, it can't go off course. No, because um, those are the questions we get. And then I got this tweet. Uh, you guys know anything about this thing in Russia? <laughs> um, the this fireball that was on all the <laughs> dashboard cams. <laughs> that was the night before. Yeah, the, the Russian uh, Chelyabinsk meteor actually hit about uh, less than 12 hours from the start of our live show. And this was the way we learned about it, okay? Um, somebody in Ecuador saw the breaking news posting to the RussiaToday.com website, and it was this really bizarre thing. It said people in Chelyabinsk are evacuating after a meteor shower. 
that doesn't make any sense. You know, meteor shower, you, you know, you're looking at the sky at night and you're seeing, you know, little falling stars. So it was like, what are they talking about? So I had to start looking, um, found a video, it was the first dash cam video of the fireball. Well, you know what, fireballs happen every day on Earth and they're usually not a big deal. Um, we actually, uh, our, our account, and the reason why this person wrote to me, had become sort of the uh, cl clearing, uh, ground for people to say, I saw this really bright thing streak across the sky tonight, what was it? And I answer, it's a fireball, it's just a mm, basketball-sized meteor, it's fine, don't worry about it, you're very lucky you saw one. If you see one in your lifetime, you will be amazed, it gives you a great appreciation for uh, how busy solar system is and that we have this wonderful atmosphere that was going to incinerate them in most cases. Um, so when I first saw the dash cam, it was like, okay, that's just a fireball, it's okay, I was getting ready to post the typical response, and then I looked at the next video, which was, the shockwave. <laughs> and then it was like, oh, okay, it's a little bigger. Um, put out calls to NASA headquarters, tried to call our, our asteroid experts, try to get them up and, and talking about this immediately because we were so close to that other flyby. And I knew everyone was going to say, did this splinter off? You know, what is this? Um, I finally caught one of our, our asteroid experts in, uh, he was actually in Vienna, Austria. It was morning his time. And um, he was at a UN conference on asteroid uh, mitigation, so it was perfect. He ran off and found the Russian experts there, and, and we were ready. We were ready, and we had, because of Twitter, actually, we, we had this information. We had all the videos. Our experts were looking at those videos. We had the experts who look at the shockwave um, readings uh, already looking at their material. So by uh, morning, uh, we, were, we were fully prepared with answers about it, and we went live with our show about the uh, DA-14, and, and it was much more exciting. Sorry I didn't put in the video, but when that little white dot zooms across the screen, it's kind of cool. Um, we broke the Curiosity landing record. We had actually 8 million people watch our show about this asteroid close flyby because we had the best lead-in ever in history. <laughs> <laughs> But it is great, um, yeah, and, and so again, this account is now turning into something we didn't expect, the Asteroid Watch Twitter account. Now, of course, since uh, Russia, I'm getting even more people asking about fireballs and giving them more information about this. And so, yeah, this was great. We're seeing an evolution of, a, of, uh, of uh, something that was meant, uh, you know, really to put out information about one thing. We're, we're morphing into what people want, the in want from us, because that's important, is to know your audience, um, psychology, know what they want, be prepared to give that to them, and be prepared to, to change your content a little bit and, and provide what they're looking for. Um, that's it for uh, the presentation. Um, I don't know if you have any more questions, but uh, I think Thank we're running a little know. over, so yes? Just an article said when the major social media and social networks are quickly and things are happening, how much thought do you put into it, like that one tweet, I am in the crater? I mean, that's <laughs> that was a special one. Yeah. 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 We were in a crater. Where is your mind? Yeah, it was a running, you know, th uh, well, it's a meme. So um, it, we, it, we started with uh, when we shipped the rover from California to Florida. When it landed in Florida, we said, Florida, I am in you. Um, but actually for landing night, what we did and, uh, is we sat down and went through every major milestone that was going to happen during landing. And we, uh, the three of us, sat down and went over all the different tweets that we were going to post that night. And we all agreed on that one. Um, but yeah, And, you know, usually it comes out with someone coming up with an idea and somebody else adding something else. And, some, you know, th between the three of us, um, we yeah. have a lot of fun if every day. If we can make each other laugh, there's a good chance that there's going to be you know, engagement and laughter elsewhere. Um, Sometimes we just look at her funny. <laughs> so this is the, we just our, our ages are kind of spaced out, and this is good uh, because then we can we have this like built-in <laughs> gut check on are people gonna get this uh, between Courtney, who's your early career hire, and then me and Veronica. And so if we get two out of three, we're you know all right, that's good. If yeah. it's one person and the other two are like. No. <laughs> yeah, back to the <laughs> it is fun. A lot of stuff I come up with, Courtney goes, I've never heard of that. <laughs> or they come up with something and I'm like, okay, explain it. Um, yeah. And then it's like, Sometimes oh. Sometimes we'll send YouTube videos along with the post <laughs> being like, and for your reference too. <laughs> <laughs> so it works really well that the, way. But the best but references, the best jokes are the ones that work on two levels. Uh, like an old Bugs Bunny cartoon, right? You look and, oh my gosh, it's so funny, I don't get it. And then mom and dad get the reference. Mm -hmm. Right, but it makes sense. You don't have to have the annotated glossary to know what it means. Yeah. Okay, I think we'll uh, let the next one come up. Thank
Thank you. Thank you. That was awesome. Um, could someone turn the, that, the first switch up? Thank you. Okay, well, that was amazing. I don't know how anyone's going to top that. Um, <laughs> uh, Get a laser. <laughs>